Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here, and welcome on back to Board Game Blender. Today we're going to be talking about board games that feel like video games or feature video game themes. You're going to be seeing a lot of segments of uh, games, board games, based on other intellectual properties from video games. I myself don't have a lot of games that are themed on other IPs, video games or otherwise. So I'm going to be talking about a couple of games that I uh, think feel like video games instead of being really based on video games. But either way, I think these kinds of games are a great uh, place to start when you are introducing tabletop gaming to people that are only into video games or to, you know, a younger generation as well that is used to the concept of video games but maybe are not as keen on sitting down around the table and just playing some cards, rolling dice, that sort of thing. Because it bridges that gap very nicely, you know, they'll understand the property or they'll get the feeling of what they do on the screen and you can easily translate that to the tabletop and go from there. Maybe that'll, you know, maybe that'll trigger something in their head that'll help them realize this is not that different from what I do on the TV screen. So. That's it for me. Uh, let's kick it off right away. Enjoy the show. Hi guys, this is Jess and Andrew from Gameosity. And before we were board gamers, we like to play other types of games. We are pretty big into role playing games, and we really love video games. Yeah, um, we've been both separately been playing video games basically our whole lives. And one of the things that you might think if you're kind of uninitiated is that, you know, video games, board games, they're all just sort of games, and uh, if you like one, you might like the other, but it can be a little tough to get kind of the experience of a board game in a video game or vice versa. All right, I've laid my rail. Ah, why? Yeah, that wouldn't really work in a game. But recently, a lot more board games have been able to capture the essence of a video game in their gameplay. I mean, you've got uh, The Witcher, which is this adventure board game, and then there's XCOM, which is a strategic tactical game, mm -hmm. and then uniquely you've got Bioshock. Yeah, Bioshock Infinite, Siege of Columbia from Plaid Hat Games. It's an area control game that's based on a first-person shooter that's equal parts about rescuing a woman trapped in a tower and an exploration of string theory and the... <laughs> you know, ripple effect of quantum singularities, but it's also a board game. Yeah. So as we said, Bioshock Infinite Siege of Columbia is an area control game featuring one of the most absurdly oversized first player tokens I've ever seen. And essentially, it's about moving armies around the board. There are two factions that will compete over territories. Uh, you will use your units to build pools of dice. Combat is resolved that way. Each card in the game is used for a bunch of different things, which we think is really cool. It can help you in combat. It can help you tip the vote that happens at the end of each round. And it can even act as currency or it might even have a discard effect. Both factions will have an upgrade board, so you have an opportunity to increase the power of your units and change how they work. And overall, what you're doing is you're fighting for control over the skybound city of Columbia, which is not what the video game is about. So with the board game, instead of following the main character of the video game, Booker, we're playing the factions that Booker comes into contact with. We're playing the bad guys. Yeah, well, yeah, depending on how you look at it. Basically, the video game is the story of this one man and his adventure through the city of Columbia. Instead, what the board game is doing is it tells the story of the factions that kind of wrap around Booker's story. The, the good guys, bad guys, depends on your perspective. The very moral gray area of people who are trying to control this city and its technology. And instead of being, you know, sort of insular about this one character, the board game makes it so that up to four people can play in this world while being engaged in the story about it. Instead of trying to emulate the video game and cardboard, this gives it a chance to be just a board game. 
Right. It can be its own thing. And what's neat is that even though it exists sort of outside the concepts of the video game mechanically, it still attaches to the game conceptually. You still zip around on skyhooks, you still fight handymen, Songbird is terrifying, and Quantum Entanglement is still a part of the board game, albeit a relatively minimal one. Yeah. It's sort of an expansion yeah. or an adaptation, not... It gives you more story instead of trying to retell the story. Exactly. Anyway, I'm Andrew. I'm Jess. And we are from Gamosity. Thanks for watching. And until then, see you next game. Hello, welcome to Boards and Crafts, a place for quick tutorials of snacks and crafts inspired from games, board games, and all about board games. In the board game that we will be creating a craft or is inspired by not one video game, not two, but a whole genre of video games, the Dungeon Crawlers. Boss Monster is a game where you are trying to create the best dungeon to lure heroes to their demise and collect their soul. The person with 10 hero souls, I believe, is the one who will win the game at the end. So today, I thought it'd be fun to create a craft that showcases the cool pixel art that is seen in the cards. So. Without further ado, let's get started in creating a 3D shadow box of one of the cards, King Croak. To create this craft, we will need an 8x10 shadow box, multiple copies of the card blown up on cardstock, scissors, an X-Acto knife, Mod Podge, a sponge, and foam sheet. The most time consuming bit of this craft is the fact that you need to create layers in order to add that dimension. To create the layers, you will need to decide what will be sending out. For example, King Croak and the Rocky Roof are standing out on this layer. However, on the next layer, you have skulls that are not cut out, but King Croak and the Rocky Roof are. So after getting your layers cut out, use the Mod Podge to glue them to the foam. Let this dry for at least 30 minutes, if not an hour. Now, when cutting the foam layers, you'll want to do this from the top down so that you can add a shadow to your art. You'll want to glue your top layer after you cut out the foam onto the layer that comes next to it, letting it dry each time before you start cutting. Make sure that it fits the frame and make adjustments if needed. This took me about seven to eight hours to fully form because of having to wait between layers to let it dry. And that's pretty much it. If you guys have any ideas for creative crafts or tasty snacks inspired by any of the board games mentioned in this segment, please comment below with your ideas or tweet them at me at RC Robot. Thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye. Hello friends of the blend and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today we're talking about board games that were based on video games. Now I had a lot to choose from. From Frogger to Pac-Man to Donkey Kong. Well I was thinking to myself what is the one that I like the most? Well here we have Zagzon published in 1982 by Milton Bradley. This is a two-player game in which you're trying to destroy Zagzon first. Let me set this up and show you how it works. So this is what the game board will look like set up. The first player will take control of the blue planes and the second player will take control of the orange planes. Now every turn the players will simultaneously roll a six-sided dice. Now the person that gets the lowest number gets to spin the spinner. When you spin the spinner, it designates the danger for that turn. The spinner has white, red, and blue spaces around here. And around the board, there's white, red, and blue spaces. Now white is that you're safe. If you ever spin the spinner on a red space, that means every red space on the board fires their weapon. And if your plane is in that location, your plane is destroyed and needs to go back to the starting space. Now you break up your die roll any way you want. So moving one space takes up a pip. Moving your plane up and down will take one pip. Shooting will take however many squares you are away to hit your target. So for example, if I rolled a six on the die, 
I can move one, two spaces and then fire three, four, five spaces to hit this target and then move one more space. So however you want to break it down, it's legal to do so. So shooting at targets, your plane needs to be at the low flying low altitude. To go over these walls right here, your plane needs to be at the high setting. When you hit this orange area right here and both planes are in the orange area, you can go ahead and try to shoot your opponent down. Now, after you get past these restart steps right here, anytime that you blow up or your ship gets destroyed here, you just restart over here. When you cross this area right here, that is when Zagzon right here starts moving. Now on the spinner you see these Z's. Every time that you spin a Z and whatever number you rolled on the dice, that's when you can move Zagzon in any direction, but it has to be the whole amount. So for example, if you did a three, you can move them one, two, three squares. Zagzon shoots in a straight arrow in the two spaces that he occupies. So he's just going to shoot straight until he hits something, whether it be a target, a plane, or a wall. And he can shoot in this direction or that direction. The first player to shoot Zagzon with both of his plane is the winner of the game. Now all the board games that came out in the 80s that were based off of video games, by far, this is my favorite one. I mean, who doesn't like a game that involves a spinner? Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. Hey everybody, for today's Quirky Game, I'm talking about World of Yoho. World of Yoho is, in my opinion, one of the absolute best examples of bridging that gap between board game and video game. You see, when you get this game, you are going to get a huge board in the box. It's, it's massive. It comes in two parts. You're going to fold both out and put them together, in fact. And little else. Yeah, there's a couple of other things in there, but that's really it. This pirate game of sailing, shooting, gathering goods is going to happen on that big board, but it's going to happen with your ships being your phones. Everybody's going to need one smartphone. Now, there's a way to play with a single phone, but you really want everybody to have their own smartphone. And you are going to download the app, which is free. You are going to put your phone on the board, and then you are going to be moving the phone around and it will represent your ship. In the game, you'll be sailing, you'll be exploring places on the map, you're going to be buying goods at different ports, you are going to go on missions, which include pickup and deliver style missions, it includes combat sometimes with the other players, it includes a variety of things, and that's basically how the game works. Once you have achieved a certain number of victory points, You'll be the winner, and the game will be over. It's a very simple design, but I think that's part of the charm. That's part of why it works. I've taught this to several different people, and it's that phone idea. Utilizing the phone on the board, being able to drag the phone across the map, and it updates to where it now is sitting, that really hooks people, and is so charming and clever. People that are used to video games, more than board games, are going to look at this and think, huh, it's a video game, but it has a board. Those of us that are used more to board games are going to look at it and go, how cool, it's a board game that utilizes your phone to help you with upkeep and a bunch of the math, right? And so that's what I like about it the most. It's a game that is going to appeal to a wide range of players depending on their experiences, depending on where they are coming from. And it's one that I would say is excellent to in, in order to get people into the tabletop hobby. Yeah, the game's not perfect. It's perhaps a little too simple. It's a little long for how simple it is. The phone can sometimes glitch a little bit, that application, but it's very easy to get it back on track. And so I would say if you are someone that is captivated by strange new concepts in board gaming. If you are someone that 
when other people say, oh, this board game has a gimmick, you perk up your ears at the idea. This is one I think you're going to like. So that's it for my quirk game, World of Yoho. Certainly would recommend it if you are looking for something strange, something different, something outside of the box that's going to feel like a board game and a video game, because really, it's kind of both. Check this one out. Hello everyone and welcome to Board Game Diagnosis, where I'm going to check what's wrong with your board games and how I can solve these problems for them. Today with me I have a big, big, massive video game star. A star that is so big that it decided to bring out its own board game. Max vs Minions is here with me today. Max, can you tell me what your problem is? Why are you here with me today? I just sometimes feel like people don't want to play with me. I'm so, so gigantic, so huge. And they don't even bring me along to their parties because I don't fit in their tiny little bags. That's not nice, Max vs. Minions. But don't people play you at home then when they can't bring you along? It's really horrible, you know. Sometimes I can't even be played at home because their tables are too tiny. It's not my fault that I'm this big. Thank you, Max. I think I understand the problem now. Let's examine you and see if you're really as big as you say you are. Okay, Max, let's see if you're really that big. I can see with my measuring tape for board games that you're 51 centimeters. Okay, Max vs. Minions, I've looked you over, I've heard your story, I think I know what your problem is. You have a form of gigantism. This sometimes happens when Producers of a game just want to put more and more into their boxes and the box just becomes bigger and bigger until you have a box that's almost as tall as I am. Sadly, you see this problem a lot more with Kickstarter games. Stretch goal after stretch goal, they just get stuffed more and more with all these amazing new stuff until they cannot fit on anyone's shelf anymore. It's really sad to see. In your case, Max, you have four beautifully painted miniatures, one big boss monster, and hundred minions. That is something that you can be very proud of, and people are going to love you for that, even if you have a bigger box and are suffering from gigantism. But Max versus minions, I think I have some solutions for your problem. Solution one. Make sure you have an owner that has a ginormous table and that he invites over as many people as possible with tiny tables so everyone can join in on the fun that is you. Oh, thank you, Anna. I'm sure to keep that in mind. That's a very good tip. That way you also solve the problem of not having a big enough bag to take you along to a game night. Just let the people come over to you and enjoy you. Another solution that you're probably going to like a lot less, Max, I'm sorry, is just swapping all of your minions with meeples. This way your box can be a lot smaller and you can be taken along to gatherings and other parties. But Anna, the minions, those are the things that make me so beautiful. Yeah, I know, Max. That brings me to solution three. People should just accept you the way that you are, with the giant box and everything that comes within it. You have so much to offer and that just comes in a little bit bigger box and that's just the way it is and people should love you for that. Yes, you're right, Anna. As soon as they see my insert, they're going to forget that I'm that big. Thank you for helping me. See you later. Glad I could help you, Max. I will see you at the table. Bye. Hey guys, it's Nerd E here and today's episode is all about video games turned into board games. And my selection for Who Am I is going to be the Oregon Trail card game that you can find at Target right now. So the Oregon Trail is a video game, a PC game, Mac game. It was on computers when I was in school. That might date me a little bit. Um, but it's a game you would play and you would be trying to get a group of a family in your wagon all the way from uh, one city to Oregon. Um, that's pretty much it. You would, you know, you do hunting, you'd gather food, you would, you know, have to fix the wheels, the axles of your thing. You'd come across different diseases or get snake bitten um, and try to make it there and hopefully not drown in the river, those kind of things. So they've made a board game, card game out of this. So the question right now is, where am I? Well, in this game, you are 
basically taking control of a player in the, the, the wagon and you're playing cards trying to build out the, the journey, building out the map that you're going through. And then when calamities hit you, you're trying to you know, assuage them. You're trying to, you know, if it gets cold, you want to have clothes. If it's some, if an oxen dies, you need to get a new one, those kind of things. So you're playing cards down to get that. Well, um, the, who am I in this is, well, I'm a character in the, the, the wagon and each time it's my turn, I'm leading the wagon, but it's, it's kind of not really, it doesn't really match up with with the game. The game you're controlling the whole party, and this you're a member of the party, but you're still controlling the party when it's your turn. So it's kind of strange, um, different weird aspects to it. So then the main topic here is how am I, and does it make sense? Well, for me, it does not make sense that I'm just a member in the party. What it feels like to me is I'm playing the game with whoever's playing with me like cooperatively at the computer and we're typing in what we want to do that's how the game is so i feel like if the the who am i in this game was someone playing the the, the computer game i think it hits on it i think it's good it works it makes sense but if i'm trying to put myself in the position of someone in the wagon which is kind of how it's structured i don't agree with it that way but that's organ trail the card game it's it's a fun video game turned into a Okay, card game. Thanks, guys. Probably it's all my fault. It was my gift to her on our wedding day. She was playing with it far too much. It's new, it'll be okay When we go to bed she stares at it During the day she doesn't look me in the eyes When I say something she promises to quit I don't want to hear any more lies Oh this ocean of emotion I take notion of explosions and admire her devotion for making different kinds of potions. I use caution, I'm not chilling while she's thrilling, re revealing. I am frozen and unwilling. Still, it looks so darn fulfilling. We are going through the motions, let it stop. All she wants to do is pop. So it's time to intervene. She needs to know it's a disease that she is sick But going straight cold turkey seems too much She's on a bubble patch that should do the trick How could a simple game have led to this? I need to know and feel it for myself I'm in control of things, going to find out what it is the dark of night, I took it from the shell. And now I'm hooked. I've got nothing but cheers. cheers. I overlooked the game with the unicorn tears. How could I ever, ever, ever want someone to stop? Cause all we want to do is... We play together, together, like birds of a feather. Weather under the weather, we know that nothing else matters. We don't need food, we're always in the mood to put away your stress. Who cares the house is a mess? If Trump can win, who are we to stop? And all I want to do is... Hey friends of the blend, welcome back to another segment of How To Fun. I'm Ben, and this week we are looking at different board games that have been inspired by video games. I'm not a huge video gamer, though I do enjoy playing them from time to time. Uh, the game though that I've chosen this week is one that is inspired by probably some of the bigger titles out there for, uh, you know, arcade tile games. Uh, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. The game though I have chosen 
is Battlecon War of Endines. So let's go ahead and take a look. In Battlecon War of Endines, you and your friend will face off head to head. By selecting from a set of common cards, you will combo them with your very own character cards. These cards together will allow you to move, attack, and defend. There are various stats on the cards that you will compare when attacking your opponent. These stats are range, power, and priority. After doing so, you each will take turns moving your various pieces and attacking. The game comes with three different sets of characters arranged by uh, difficulty and complexity. There is a secondary manual that comes with the game with bios for all of the different characters as well as their special abilities and different strategy tips while playing them. The game makers have gone through a great lengths to make sure that each character feels and plays very differently from the last. There are also a number of different modes and variants found in the back to keep each game different and rewarding. The player who defeats his opponent first is the winner. Hopefully from the description there you were able to draw a, a few connections to these popular titles out there that do something similar on you know, the giant arcade machines. But if you're not familiar with them, they are Mortal Wombat and Beat Fighter. Go ahead and go look those up. Fun games. But anyways, this game is basically themed, styled the same as those. You've got two fighters going head to head, trying to get rid of the life points of the other. But instead of using buttons and jumping around on a screen, you are using card play to outmaneuver and outwit your opponent and try to make those combos with just the right timing. It's a really neat idea and one I was very excited to try. I actually went ahead and sold a couple games from my collection in order to buy this one and a couple others at the time in hopes of finding something that would play well at two players and give a wide variety of replayability. I chose War of Endines basically because it was a good middle ground. You have Devastation of Endines which is like the mother load of uh, Battlecon. It comes with I think 32 or something playable characters. It's pretty expensive but it's got a ton of content. On the other end of the spectrum you've got Fate of Endines which has 10 playable characters, is a little bit cheaper, and you know it's kind of a nice introductory point to the series. War of Endines is right there in the middle with 18 characters and you know a decent uh, price. So that's why I chose this one of the series, and I was really excited to try it. I've tried it out with a couple different friends, and I'll be honest, I'm not going to lie to you, I don't have any tip for making this thing more fun. Not because it's already a blast to play, but because I really didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. I don't know what it was, it just didn't click with me, or anyone I played it with for that matter. So this week on How To Fun, I am coming to you, the viewer, for a tip to make this game more fun for me. I really would like to keep it. I think it's a novel idea. Uh, like I said, it's got a good replayability, lots of strategy and tactics involved. I thought it'd be something that I would really enjoy, but it wasn't. So please tell me in the comments below how I can make this game more fun for me and my friends. I would really appreciate it because I really want to keep the game in my collection, but I'm probably not going to if I can't figure out a way to make it more enjoyable soon. So, that's your assignment. Help me out. Thanks for watching this week of How To Fun. And in the meantime, keep having fun playing games. See ya.
All right then. Speaking of magic, I believe it paved the way for dozens of other trading card games. SimCity has one, Mortal Kombat, and Tomb Raider. One that is still printed today is Pokemon, which came out in 1996. The computer game audience started to become more apparent with the rise of the home computer market at this time. So in turn, we got games like Carmen Sandiego and Myst. This was still a very cold time, and there's even a card game, Triple Triad, that was based on a card game in a video game. Like many games I talked about before, there aren't still good, and the mainly take from designs of most mainstream board games. Between the years of 2000 and 2010, video games are an industry giant, and board games are taking a big turn and becoming something we know today. This is also the first time that we finally get games we still play today. One is Age of Empires 3, the Age of Discovery ranked 105 on Board Game Geek. Another is World Rays of the World, previously known and based on the computer game Railroad Tycoon. It's highly regarded and ranked 75th on Board Game Geek. Fantasy Flight Games also did a few licensed titles including World of Warcraft, Starcraft, and Doom. All were very well received, which is in contrast to many of the other licensed games of the time. We finally made it to the present and I have to say a lot of good things. We are seeing the greatest amount of influx of these kind of games being made. These aren't just licensed video games, but also original board games with video game themes. Game companies like Level 99 Games and Serlin Games both develop games that borrow on themes and mechanisms from the video game genre. And there are even throwbacks to retro video games like Kremble's Cascade and Boss Monster. App-based board games also make an appearance. Fruit Ninja, Angry Birds, and Doodle Jump just to name a few. Licensed video games are even borrowing modern game mechanisms. Street Fighter and Resident Evil both have deck building game versions. Other games including Bioshock Infinite, The Siege of Columbia, XCOM, Mule, a game from the 80s, Sid Meier's Civilization, the soon-to-be-out Dark Souls, and Mega Man is even being developed using the pixel tactic system. Video game companies are starting to get in too. Of course, we recently heard the buzz of Riot Games' Mechs and Minions based on League of Legends, and even Square Enix has a card game starring Chocobos from the Final Fantasy series. These are exciting times, and I'm hopeful in the future that we now see digital game companies taking tabletop gaming more seriously. I wish I had more time to talk about these wonderful games. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember to keep on stacking games. episode is all about games that were video games and now they're board games and now you know cardboard killed the video store and all that kind of stuff anyway um i i was really really racking my brain i'm still really having a difficult time finding a game that has replaced the video version of the game for me and i just can't think of a game that I've played on the video game format that the board game version of that game has has kind of replaced the video version. I just haven't... Man, what is... Get this out of the way. What is... Chibi Miniature... No. Out. Pass. I mean, it's still in shrink. It can't be that good, right? Anyway, let's get to a couple of games that I have picked for this episode. Now, I decided to go in a couple of different avenues this way. Um, the first game that I'm going to show you right here is X-Wing the Miniatures game. And this is a game that has totally replaced the video game versions of the game. Now, I know that you didn't actually see um, this isn't a direct correlation to the video games, but the LucasArts had uh, a game called X-Wing, and then they also had TIE Fighter. Then they had a game called X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, and it was just a lot of neat stuff. I played the mess out of those video games, probably logged way more hours than I should have on a computer during college, I might add. Um, and uh, this game has really kind of... Uh, not replaced, but has filled that niche that is now left void because I don't have any of those games. I know you can get them on Steam, but they're pixelated, not that great anymore. I mean, they were great for their day, but eh, you know. Uh, anyway, this 
uh, game X-Wing miniatures. Now, this is just the storage solution that I use for X-Wing miniatures. It's, you know, basically a tackle box. Uh, but the, the miniatures that you have in these things, they're just phenomenal. Uh, as you can see here, they're just very cool. Extended universe type stuff as well. Uh, just really great miniatures. Very solid, very uh, durable. Um, got some Y-Wings in here too. <laughs> All this kind of stuff that wasn't the right kind of sound for a Y wing. But now, again, I'm very, I'm very much a casual player of the game. I don't know what what ships work best with what pilots and what ships work best together and how to, you know, grok all of the different combos and all that kind of stuff. I don't play like that. This is a very a casual game for me because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So I love just flying these ships around and shooting, making pew 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 noises and that type of stuff. The other avenue that I'm going for here is that avenue where the board game has not replaced the video game for me. Now, before XCOM the board game came out, I was huge into XCOM the video game. Back in the original version where it was, you know, a very pixelated um, uh, experience and all that kind of stuff. But man, you play that game at night with the lights turned off and you will scare the bejeebies out of yourself um, uh, more, more than once. And the XCOM video game, the new one that has come out for the new platforms and, and on Steam and all that kind of stuff, has been a tremendous reskinning uh, of the game, and it's just an amazing experience. Unfortunately, this game kind of focuses on that administerial version of the game and in the background is all of the tactic and strategy of going out on missions and that type of stuff. And that was kind of a letdown for me because I really enjoyed the tactical uh, mission aspect of the video game and this one has that as almost like a side note kind of um, it's definitely not first and foremost so. while I think this is a great design and it is a game that is worthy of your checking out for me personally it has not replaced the video game version of it I would much rather go and play uh, XCOM the video game version. now if Eric Lane comes out with a tactical version of XCOM where it's all about those different missions and those different scenarios that you can throw up you know it's there Eric I'm gonna be all over that like white on rice but hey that's it for me look I know I know some of the things I do and say I don't really follow the rules all the time but look I'm just trying to keep it real see you on the flip side For today's Under the Radar game, I'm taking a look at Draco, a game exclusively for two players, in which one player is going to be playing the part of a dragon, the other player represents a band of three dwarves trying to take down that dragon, and of course the dragon is trying to take down the dwarves. The game takes place in a small hexagonal board, and what I find really interesting and clever about it, and what makes it feel like a video game to me, is the way in which the game plays. It's a very fast game. It's uh, card driven, but you are going to just be throwing these cards out. The player across the table from you will be able to respond, cancel your attacks, move in response to your attacks, and both sides are asymmetrical. So depending on what side you play, the experience is going to feel a little bit different. The game is completely language independent, and as I said, the cards are really simple. You'll have things on the cards like attack, defend, move, the dwarves can throw a net and try to hinder the dragon, things like that. And that card-driven gameplay is going to feel just like a skirmish in a fantasy video game. Another really clever aspect of the game is the way in which you damage both sides. You see, the dwarves have three characters, as you can see here, and the dragon player, as they uh, put damage on these characters, there will be several different abilities that can be shut down once these guys die. Once you get one off the board, you don't have to contend with that character anymore. The dragon is slightly different. It's a single character, of course, but the players have to decide uh, what is being damaged, and so things will start to go, like the fire breath, if that takes a certain number of damage uh, tokens, 
that's going to stop working. The dragon will also be uh, damaged in its wings, and so it'll not be able to take off of the battlefield and land elsewhere in the battlefield. It'll have to actually uh, traverse the landscape. And so this whole concept, while again very simple and very straightforward, is really clever and very engaging. If you want a game that has a lot going on in it, this is probably not going to be it. Uh, this is a button masher, really. That's sort of how it feels if you compare it to a video game. But it's engaging, it's fun, both sides do feel very different, and the game's quick. It's going to give you a, a feeling of trying to overcome your adversary, and you are going to feel like your own side is different. You know, you're going to have your own abilities, your own strengths and weaknesses, and once you're done playing, oftentimes you're going to want to switch sides and give it another shot. A really fun game, one that unfortunately has, I've never seen anyone else playing it. I'm not sure how easily available or how difficult it is to find, but one that I would say if you ever come across it somewhere, you're a fan of two-player games, especially ones that feel asymmetrical, this is one I would very much recommend. And again, it's got that great skirmish, tight quarters feel. It's a hack and slash in a board game fashion. So that's it for me. That is Draco from Rebel PL and designer Adam Kaluza. A very cool two-player game and one that I would very much recommend if you ever come across it. That's it for me, folks. See you next time for Under the Radar. Boop, 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 boop. Hello folks, Mark here, and welcome to Thinking Inside the Box. In this series, I'm focusing on inserts, storage solutions, and games that already do both really well. Today we're taking a look at Hits the Road. Regardless if you like this game or not, it is absolutely beautiful. The aesthetics are amazing. In Hits the Road, you and your friends will see Chicago. You'll drive through Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. You'll drive through small towns, downtowns, and witness the vastness of the American countryside. You'll eat at diners. You'll hit New Mexico and Arizona. You'll see the plains, the deserts, and of course, the zombie hordes. Part survival game, part horror story, Hits the Road boasts tension and irony in equal measures as you hunt for gas and scavenge for ammo in order to blast through zombies and barrel your way down the highway to LA. In the end though, you don't necessarily have to be faster than the zombies. You just have to be faster than your friends are. The game has bidding, resource management, and dice chucking. But for me, this game really shines due to its really tight resource management, which means lots and lots of tokens that are in desperate need of some organization. So let's take a closer look at different options for storage for this one. In general, I'm not looking for just a storage solution, but also a convenient way to play and set up the game. Geekbox and the Treasure Tray token holders are ideal solutions for this game. Both are very reasonably priced, and both companies have done a great job in the design of these trays. Treasure Trays comes in multiple colors and are stackable, with secure lids designed specifically with the board gamer in mind. These trays are perfect for storing the different resource tokens in Hits the Road, gas, ammo, and adrenaline, along with the assorted special tokens, survivor meeples, and of course, the dreaded zombies. For the bidding markers, lead survivor meeples, and dice, I use the Geek Box token holder. These boxes are a bit deeper than the Game Tray solution. Both work fantastic to keep all the pieces well organized and accessible for easy setup and teardown. All the cards, initiative tiles, and keys are stored with your standard game bags. So here is Hits the Road, set up and ready to play. I love how these trays make set up and tear down a breeze. I'm a big fan of storage solutions that not only store the game, but aid or enhance the gameplay in some way. Setting up these trays for easy access to all players makes them a perfect solution. And I do believe these containers are going to be my go-to over bags for the foreseeable future. If I had to pick one over the other, hmm. 
You know, it's a tough choice, but I think Treasure Trays is the winner here. Yes, both are stackable, but Treasure Trays interlocks in a stackable fashion, and the lids lock into place for easy storage during gameplay. I do like how deep and roomy the Geekbox trays are, but bottom line is, you really can't go wrong with either of these solutions. Make sure you give Hit Zero a closer look. It's an interesting mix of gaming mechanics, and again, the aesthetics are fantastic. Just a beautiful game. All right, folks, thanks for watching. Happy organizing, and until next time, we'll see you at the table. Howdy folks, Rebecca and Hunter here for Two Player Showdown. In 1986, a arcade game company, Bally Midway, came out with a game called Rampage, in which you play a monster, various kinds of monsters, going around a city, crushing buildings, eating people, and doing all sorts of destructive things. In an unrelated occurrence, Repo Productions came out with a game called Rampage! Terror in Meeple City plays two to four players, ages eight and up, and lasts around 30 minutes. It's a great game where you've got these ginormous lizards and you're terrorizing and stomping through the metropolis and destroying things and flipping buildings and vehicles. It's a great game. Let's take a look at it. So this is what the setup of the game looks like. We'll show you some of the moves. Here are some of the different things you can do during your turn. You can move. You can demolish. You can toss a vehicle. And you can breathe. So Rampage, aka Terror in Meeple City, has become a family favorite. Even the little one who is five likes to play this game, although probably not with as much success as the adults, of course. But it's pretty easy to take a little monster and go destroy things. It's very fun. Everyone enjoys it. Yes, you can take that family weight game and kind of kick it up a notch. It's still super lightweight, but you can add cards that give you special abilities, you get character cards that give you special power and superpowers and all kinds of cool um, special things. And also there's a, a basic side to the board. When meeples fall off the board, they flee the city and you take bad consequences for that. And there's a basic side and there's also an, a more advanced side that uh, you can play with. It's not much different, but adds a little, little, little bit more to the game. A little more punitive, yes. And this game is weighted quite well, so it's pretty fun to play two-player, although it's a little bit easier to avoid each other than when you're playing with the full four people. Yep. All player counts. Very enjoyable game. So we highly recommend Rampage, a.k.a. Terror in Meeple City. Thank you so- Rampage! <laughs> cool catchphrase. One year ago, November 12th, 2015, our first board game blender aired. It's been a great year. We've come a long way. Yes, we have. From Camel Cup, Camel Up, all the way now to Rampage. 
And we haven't missed an episode in the last year either. So we want to thank Z for this opportunity, and we've had a blast, and we're looking forward to many more to come. Yes, and we want to thank you guys for all your fun and support. And that's it for this episode, everybody. Thanks very much for tuning in. Big thank you, as always, to my contributors. And I hope to see you again in a couple of weeks where we're going to be talking about big games that come in itty-bitty boxes. So come on back for that. And as always, hey, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.